going to be the moderator for our webinar today. Um, and I am the director of the Colorado Heal Cities and Towns campaign. And on behalf of the Colorado campaign, as well as the campaigns in the Northwest, the Mid-Atlantic, and California, we'd like to welcome you to the webinar today. Um, just a little bit of background about the Heal Cities and Towns campaigns or the Heal Cities campaigns. Um, all of our campaigns in our uh, respective regions are housed in a public health or nonprofit organization that has developed a, a, a partnership with the State Municipal League. And it's through this partnership that we work with our um, respective states to support local elected officials and municipal staff to adopt policies that promote access to healthy, affordable foods, active living, and a healthy municipal workplace. And today's webinar is one in a series of webinars that is ho hosted by the National Heal Cities Campaigns. And we chose healthy food at meetings and vending as it is one of the most important steps a municipality can take toward making the healthy choice the easy choice for employees while at work. And on healthy vending, it also reaches beyond employees to the public, making the healthy choice the easy choice for visitors to municipal facilities, including recreation centers, libraries, and parks. And so you'll see our agenda today. So I have just a few more things to go over. And then we're going to hear from a great panel of speakers that um, have a lot of um, background to offer on healthy eating at the workplace. And just to kind of set the stage a little bit, um, you'll find out as we go along that the guidelines that municipal food guidelines that municipalities have adopted, they really vary. And some are pretty aggressive, and they might mirror the national competitive food standards, standards, but others have taken a softer approach, which is also a great step. So in some of municipalities, some of our municipalities, um, they're not eliminating the unhealthy choices, but they're making sure that they include healthy choices as an option. And you know, sometimes this is a more politically feasible um, approach to take. And as we all know, when we're making policy, we have to think about the politics surrounding it. But regardless, overall, we just hope that by participating in this webinar, um, you'll be inspired to take action in your municipality and um, help increase the culture of wellness within your, within your respective municipalities. So just a few housekeeping um, items to go over. Just so that you know, the webinar is being recorded. Um, so it's available, will be available to watch at a later date. And all of your microphones have been muted, um, just to be sure that everybody can hear clearly. But we do encourage you to ask questions. And you can do that. Um, you should have a question bar on the right-hand panel. And so at any time, you can type in questions there or share comments. Um, we really want to hear from you. And um, at the end of the webinar, we'll have hopefully have some time for questions and answers. And um, regardless, we will try to answer the questions um, via email if we can do that. And if you have a question right now, go ahead and type it in. And um, it, it just helps us to know what you're thinking. Um, and if anybody is having a hard time hearing the webinar, um, you can let us, I, I guess, put that in the question bar as well. Um, you may need to switch in and dial in with your phone if you're having a hard time hearing. All right, so um, I'm going to quickly introduce our, um, our speakers. So I'm the moderator. We have Charlotte Dixon, who is the director of the National Hill Cities Campaign. Um, we have Q Dang, who is the VP of Programs and a senior staff attorney at Change Lab Solutions. Um, Jonathan Logan, who um, will be one of our interviewees, is the executive director of the Marin Community Services District in the city of Marin. And Ismael Aguila is the recreation and community service, services operations manager for the city of San Fernando. And really quickly, before we turn it over to our speakers, we have um, one poll question that we would love for everybody to take a second to answer. And um, you should see it on your screen now. And um, this will just help us know kind of what starting point the participants are in. So if you could go ahead and just choose the answer that is best describes where you're at, that would be perfect, even if there's not one that's perfect for where you, your organization is.
So I'm thinking that everybody has had a chance to weigh in. And actually, could one of my California colleagues, are you guys seeing the results on your end, and could you um, report back? Um, yes, this is Charlotte, and it looks like of those who have voted, which is over 90%, 24% um, have vending guidelines only, 15% have healthy meeting food guidelines, but not vending guidelines, 36% don't have guidelines but are considering them, and 24% don't have guidelines but want to learn more through this webinar. That's it. So, great. So, I mean, that really helps us out. And it's, it's interesting to know where folks are in their organizations. Um, so now I think we will get into the, um, the gist of our um, webinar. And we are going to start with Charlotte. And Charlotte, um, a little bit more about Charlotte. She is the Senior Policy Director for Northern California for the California Center for Public Health Advocacy. And she is our lead of the, of the National Hill Cities um, campaign. Um, and before this work, um, she founded and directed the California, oh, and, and she, yes, she was the director of the California Hill Cities campaign before she became the director of the National Hill Cities campaign. Um, and that campaign has been very successful with over 150 cities that have adopted a resolutions and policies that address access to healthy food and um, physical activity. And Charlotte has worked closely with the League of California Cities, County Departments of Health, Community-Based Health Coalitions, and Advocates. And so Charlotte, I'd like to turn it over to you now to um, get into your section of the webinar. So um, great. We're back on track with our slides. Thank you so much. So. As we start, I want to share with you some of the science that is being published about the health impacts of sugar-sweetened beverages, um, because this has really emerged as one of the points of evidence that I think cities and, and all of us who are concerned about the health of communities um, need to know as we move forward with our nutrition standards. Um, I think we as a society have the impression that sugary drinks or beverages with added sugar are not good for health. I think that's commonly known. But what we now know much more specifically is that liquid sugar is extremely harmful to human health. And again, this science forms one piece of evidence for nutrition standards. And for those of you in, in the public health field, you'll see a lot of evidence-based strategies, the evidence, the evidence. Well, this is evidence um, that we can use to, to really move forward with nutrition standards. So believe it or not, we as a society, um, people in our society, each individual American on average drinks 45 gallons of sugary beverages a year. So if you're one of those people who sees this and says, oh no, I don't drink 45 gallons of soda or sports drinks or energy drinks, or sweetened tea, or punch, or fruit aid, or nectar. If you're one of those people who says, all of those sugary drinks, I don't drink 45 gallons, there's somebody else in the, in the country who is drinking your share. Um, so that's a lot. And that's 39 pounds of sugar added to um, the diet per year, just from sugary drinks. And what we now know, and this is what we want to show you, is that when children drink one soda a day, um, their overweight or obesity, their risk of uh, gaining weight and becoming overweight and, or be and obese increases by 55%. Um, and when among women who are drinking a soda a day, or a sports drink, or a couple of these sweetened teas, uh, their diabetes risk increases 80%. And if that's not startling enough, there's research out of the University of Davis um, with you know, live subjects that shows that if you drink two bottles of soda a day for two weeks, your cholesterol and triglycerides will increase by 20%. And if you do that for six months, and we know there are many, many people in the society who are doing this, um, 
you are at risk for fatty liver. And in fact, the incidence of fatty liver disease increases. So I think that um, what we know now is that humans are not designed to consume liquid sugar, sugary drinks, including sodas are liquid sugar, and they pose um, har significant harms. So now I want to move to the first area of focus um, in our webinar, which is the importance of healthy meeting. And many meetings take place in the city work for, workplace, um, predominantly in the administrative departments, but also in our commissions, um, our council, community meetings, lots of meetings. Um, and so meetings are an excellent opportunity for cities to provide healthy food and healthy beverages. Adults go back to that. Um, we know that adults are not getting the recommended fruits and vegetables that is recommended by the USDA. And by bringing healthy food and bringing healthy beverages into meetings, we're actually helping our employees and helping our community members you know, get the nutrition that they need. And we're also supporting health, and we're setting an example for the community. In fact, uh, nutrition standards for meetings and also for vending, and we're going to hear a lot about vending in a few minutes, um, are no and low cost policies. And I think no and low cost policies are very important for cities to be tuned into at this time because of fiscal constraints. And, it's, and, and we want to talk about no and low cost policies in contrast to the um, Tremendous amount of money cities are paying for health care premiums, workers' comp, sick leave. You know, nutrition standards really stand out as a no or low cost way to support health. Um, so what do healthy meetings look like? Um, this is a picture from Thousand Oaks. It's a city in Ventura County down in Southern California. And this city has really pioneered uh, workforce wellness through uh, partnerships with community organizations, health serving organizations, the hospital, and here they are taking a delivery from the fruit guys. So one aspect of healthy meetings is healthy food, whether it's the meals that you're serving or the snacks that you're serving. And what is healthy food at a meeting? Well, it could and should include fruit, vegetables, it could include whole grains, like whole grain crackers, whole grain, wheat, whole grain pita bread, um, low fat dairy items, um, and also healthy beverages. And when we say healthy beverages, I think what we're seeing is that water is really the best beverage for you to be providing in a healthy meeting. And you can um, you can spice it up by um, adding cut fruits and vegetables. Um, another aspect of a healthy meeting is a physical activity break when meetings are over one hour. And um, a physical activity break can create many benefits, including uh, more attention. I don't know about you, but if I sit in a conference room without a window for more than 60 minutes, I start to get a little bit distracted. The physical activity break can help me um, with my circulation, get more blood and oxygen to the brain, take a small break so that when I sit down again, I have um, better attention. So I want to show you uh, the next slide, which is the uh, a resource for healthy meetings. The National Alliance for Nutrition and Activity has just put out a healthy meeting toolkit. And on one of our closing slides, we will be able to show you the link to that toolkit. And in your follow-up email, we will also include the link. And this is an excellent resource for you to um, download. It has a menu of options that you can take a look at um, and tailor to your setting. So you don't have to do everything. You can do something. And this toolkit is really going to give you a menu of opportunities and some very specific guidelines, like how do you make that flavored water? What is a good lunch item to serve? Um, so we want you to take advantage of this excellent toolkit, which is just hot off the presses. 
Um, here are some frequently asked questions from the toolkit, and I just wanted to briefly review these with a couple of answers. Won't healthy meetings cost more? Um, not necessarily. One is you should consider whether you should serve food at all. Um, often we serve food as a way to show our hospitality. Um, people are eating way too much food. Perhaps you don't have to, to have food at all. So take a look at that. Um, also consider the portion sizes. We know that we all eat way too much food. If you decide that you do want to have food because it's a way of welcoming people to your meeting, think about having less food. And then when you consider the long-term health care costs, what is caused by eating poor food of poor nutritional quality in the long run, the healthy food is going to cost your organization less rather than more. Why shouldn't I serve sugar-sweetened beverages? Well, we talked a little bit about the science uh, just a few minutes ago, and I do want to let you know that the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention wants Americans to reduce their consumption of sugary drinks. So we can do that by just offering water uh, when people come to our meetings and, we can, and support their health by, by focusing on water. Similarly, why should I remove or reduce desserts or pastries? When I think about this question, I think about all of my colleagues who are dieting. And I think about the multi-billion dollar diet industry and how people who are overweight know they're overweight. They're trying very hard to lose weight. And it's something that's really hard to do. I think those of us who've been on a diet knows, know how hard it is to lose weight and to keep that weight off. When we offer high fat, high calorie desserts and pastries, we're basically sabotaging our employees who are trying very, very hard to become healthier. Um, and what we've learned is that beautiful, delicious look at, look, looking fruit can actually make people happy, and you're inviting them to eat something that's healthy, and you're not sabotaging their um, effort to be helpful. So that's another reason to just reduce the desserts or pastries. Why should I incorporate a movement break? Uh, I gave you a couple of answers a few minutes ago about attention. Um, productivity. Also, uh, these activity breaks can really build the team. I find that after an activity break, people are smiling, they're happy, they've done something together. Um, that can really increase mood uh, and make people just better suited for the hard work ahead. Um, and there is also some evidence from 10-minute physical activity breaks that things like waist circumference, um, is affected you know, positively, that the triglycerides and cholesterol are affected positively. It only takes a few minutes to get people's metabolism up and to get the benefits of physical activity um, going in the, in the body and in the group. And when you think about how adults are supposed to get 30 minutes of physical activity a day, if we can provide some opportunities for people to even get 10 minutes of physical activity, we help them get a third of their daily recommended activity. Um, and then finally, why should we adopt a policy? Policies are a way that we institutionalize practices and programs and make things easier for people to do and to, to incorporate that into the norms and practices of our organization. Um, you will, by the end of this uh, webinar, have an idea of some policies that have been adopted by our featured cities, Marin City and San Fernando. And then again, we will be sending you some uh, resources that you can use to incorporate this into your meetings. Um, so with that, I'll turn it back over to Julie, who will introduce uh, our speaker from Change Lab Solutions. Great. Thanks, Charlotte. Um, I think those are really helpful um, tips. And I think it's um, especially great to point out how they're low and no cost and can really make a big difference in the way um, people live their lives. So great, now we'll turn it um, over to our next speaker, who is Q Dang, who is VP of Programs and a Senior Staff Attorney at Change Lab Solutions. And as Vice President of Programs at Change Lab, Q is Deputy Director of the National Policy and Legal Analysis Network to Prevent Childhood, Childhood Obesity, known as NPLAN. And he oversees the development and dissemination of legal and policy tools aimed at addressing the environmental causes of childhood obesity. 
So Q, if you'd like to take it over from here, that would be great. Hi, everyone. Um, it's great to be here on this call. I'm sorry, I'm getting a little bit of um, background noise uh, just a second from um, outside my office. Um, I just want to start off um, this kind of uh, scary looking blue slide that's up. Um, all this is saying is that our organization, even though we have lawyers on staff, we're not providing uh, legal representation. Um, likewise, we're talking about policy and different policy approaches, but we're not, uh, we're not lobbying on any specific legislation uh, or that is out there. Um, you know, um, Charlotte, um, Charlotte kind of Charlotte finished up talking about policy a little bit, and I think that's where I want to start. Um, we think of policy uh, as something that's uh, generally in writing, something that's binding, um, but it doesn't have to be these things. And so, um, you know, sometimes policies aren't in writing. Sometimes um, they are um, things that encourage things uh, or uh, instead of requiring them. Um, but in terms of the strongest policies that are out there, um, those are the ones that, uh, that are in writing and um, have requirements that are enforceable and uh, want people to be ac accountable. So that's really what I'm going to be talking about is the potential for those types of policies and contracts in vending. Um, we, we talked a little bit about the healthy meetings already. Um, when Charlotte talked with folks on this call to talk about what topics we would talk about, I know that there were a lot of people that were also interested in other topics like government procurement, uh, healthy cafeterias, those sorts of things. A lot of what I'm going to talk about today um, is applicable to those other settings, but I'm really going to focus in on uh, vending. Even with vending, if you look on the examples here of what policies Oh, I'm sorry, could you go back one? Um, in terms of what you look here, in terms of the examples of policies, you'll find vending policies um, wrapped up in almost all of these bullets. You, there are vending policies in the federal regulations. Uh, Health and Human Services has uh, GSA, has uh, guidelines on vending, concessions, and sustainability. Um, we're going to talk a lot about contracts. Um, we may be talking about local or state laws. We may be talking about school board policies. Um, the one that we're not going to talk about a lot is zoning language. Um, but even then, when we, we're talking about, um, you know, what you're allowed to put in in terms of mobile vending or into parks or other places where young people might be, um, there is some of that involved in healthy vending policies also. So what we're going to try to do today is we're just going to walk through um, seven steps that you can take in order to make healthy vending something that is a uh, reality in where in your local jurisdictions. Um, this is uh, these seven steps are outlined in a resource we have called Making Change. Um, I'll we'll have the link for that resource later on in the webinar, and that's available on our website. Um, and you'll see that we want to start by finding out where the vending machines are, and then we'll walk through who we need to talk to in order to um, get healthy vending done, and then all the way through to adopting that policy, implementing it, and having things in place with the policy and the contract that will aid with enforcement. So the first step, where are the vending machines? How do we know you know, where it is that uh, these vending machines are in our city, cities and towns? This seems like a really simple question, but a lot of times um, people don't actually know um, where all the vending machines are um, and you know, who controls the vending machines. And it's important if you're going to be implementing healthy vending to start out with a goal of what it is that you want to do. What is it that you want to change and where it is? So if we were to do some kind of a brainstorming activity uh, with you and folks in your, in your uh, the, the folks that you work with, you would find out that vending machines uh, exist in a number of different places. Um, but can we have the next slide? Um, their vending machines can be found um, in, at schools and public buildings, libraries, rec centers, 
government centers, city lunchrooms, cafes and cafeterias at government buildings, hospitals, libraries, city-owned sports, stadiums, entertainment venues. And I'm sure if, if there are many that I have left out of this list and that you can think of. Um, and it's important to just get started to know what it is that you're what it, what the, where the vending machines are that you want to make a, a positive change with. The next question that you want to ask, the next step, is uh, who you need to get involved. Um, again, we're talking about this idea of, um, of uh, vending, um, and it's hard to separate. Here's one where it's hard to separate out vending from uh, other procurement policies and also healthy cafeterias. Um, and healthy meetings, because a lot of times it's the same people, the same partners that you will need to get involved in order to talk about vending. So, Blythe, if you can put up the next slide, uh, we have a list of all the potential partners, not all, many of the potential partners that you may need to talk to um, in order to work on a healthy vending policy. Now, this list may look uh, intimidating. There's lots of people here, but as many of you know from doing this work, um, it's important to set up broad coalitions um, of people um, and experts and stakeholders uh, in any of these areas. Um, it's really important to highlight um, that uh, you may be connecting um, business and purchasing people to, to nutrition people here. Um, some of these partners you may be reaching out to in order to get community support. Um, some of these other partners that you reach out to may be uh, technical uh, experts, people with technical know-how who can help you understand pragmatically how food is purchased uh, for vending machines, how it's sourced, and who makes the decisions for um, you know, how those products are purchased and placed. Um, you need nutrition experts uh, to show uh, health needs and uh, talk about standards and criteria. Um, you need to talk with your employees. You need to talk with consumers, um, people visiting buildings, uh, because ultimately those are the people who are going to make um, this a successful um, initiative um, for, if you're a vessel vending initiative. Um, one of the key partners that you have to reach out to is the person who controls um, the vending machines in uh, in the buildings that you're looking at or in the di other places that you're looking at. Um, depending on the venue and function um, of your healthy vending goals, there are different policy makers and purchasing directors who may be in control. Um, you're gonna, you may ultimately need authorization from, a from the person who's in charge of making decisions on vending machines. Um, this could be an individual department or agency head. This could be a governing board. It could be a mayor. It could be a city council. Um, in some cases, vending machines may be controlled by a union collective bargaining agreement. So those are other people who you might need to get involved. Uh, the key question is who sets the purchasing policies for the machines or food, food outlets that, that you're trying to improve? Um, and uh, you, you may need to start with the mayor's office, um, the municipal website, uh, a purchasing department, or a city manager. Once you've identified who is the person that's in control, um, there are different approaches that you can take to talking to this person. Um, from working with different jurisdictions around the country, we've learned that there are different um, uh, things that you should be prepared to uh, do as you reach out to these decision makers. Um, it's really important to be prepared and know what their goals are and what their concerns are. Um, it's important to be prepared and have um, the sample policies and the sample standards and um, the employees that you're working with who uh, are excited about healthy vending. Having these people with you um, is really important. The one thing that's that's important to not come to that meeting with is, is the sense that you're somehow doing something that's morally uh, uh, better than what uh, that decision maker is already doing. We've learned that that's not a successful approach. Um, it's important to have all of the uh, tips. Um, you know, Charlotte gave some really great uh, advice about 
um, some, uh, all of the science and uh, ways to frame this work that we're doing. Um, but it's important to also recognize that people in food service, people who are doing vending machines, they are already successfully doing their job. Um, and it's important for us to come to the table with an understanding that they are doing their job and our goal is to sh is to let them know that the, that there are employees and other folks who are interested in healthy vending um, and there are policies and standards and other resources that can help um, help them uh, achieve healthy vending um, as a goal. In terms of um, you know, once you've talked to that decision maker, uh, once you have your partners um, assembled, um, a common question is going to be, well, what are the nutrition standards for vending? What are the beverage standards that you're going to use? What does healthy mean? Um, this varies across um, different places. Um, there are, are um, you know, dozens of different standards out there that you can pick or adapt your local standards from, and it's important uh, for people to be able to put together um, what they want to do. Both Julie and Charlotte talked about the importance of uh, incremental steps and uh, how any step in this direction is can be seen as success. Um, that being said, uh, we have, uh, I'd like to highlight two sets of standards that are really strong um, and that, um, and that serve as excellent starting off points for healthy beverage vending uh, policies. The first is the CCPHA's um, beverage, uh, beverage and uh, snack standards. Um, and these are done by setting. Um, uh, CCPHA standards have been applied to um, lots of municipal facilities and programs and adopted by cities. Uh, partner organizations uh, around the, the around California and around the, the country. Uh, CCPHA standards reflect uh, SB 12 and SB 965. These are California uh, state school standards, and these are strong standards for schools. Uh, the one exception that makes the CCPHA uh, standards even stronger is that they eliminate sports drinks also. So under these standards, there's no sodas. There's no sports drinks, as well as the other sh sugary beverages. Um, and diet sodas are allowed only in adult settings. Um, they're not um, allowed in youth serving settings. Uh, another set of standards that I'd like to reference here is the uh, National Alliance for Nutrition and Activity uh, Standards. These are the NANA beverage and snack standards. Um, the, uh, this alliance. Uh, is comprised of 400 plus public and private organizations and is housed at the Center for Science in the Public Interest. Um, this, the standards here were created through a, a lengthy collaborative process. Um, they apply to youth settings. Um, and in these standards, um, there is um, no diet uh, sodas are allowed either. So if that's something that uh, you want to implement, um, this would be a good place to start also. Once you've um, selected and uh, possibly adapted your standards, um, you move on to the level of the step of adopting policy. Uh, here, you know, you really have to hone in on what level is your policy at. Is it uh, a purchasing agreement that just affects one building? Does it affect an entire agency? Is it, is it a directive across different agencies? Is it a local ordinance that uh, affects all uh, city buildings? Um, there are difficulties in the current fiscal um, climate. Um, lots of uh, anything, any kind of a policy that's seen as regulation um, can, can also be seen as something that is penalizing um, um, city agencies. So it's important to, um, you know, address, uh, identify what the difficulties are in um, in the particular climate and environment that you're in. Um, one way to uh, to address this is to look at whether positive incentives are something that can be provided. Um, you may be able to um, ha find funding for pilot programs uh, to um, incentivize. Uh, 
bottled water or healthier beverages um, so that the pricing uh, is competitive um, or better than um, sugary beverages if you're, go if you're not going with a 100% uh, healthy beverage vending policy. Um, it's also important to consider what competing goals uh, might be out there. Um, you know, uh, in some places people are worried about the loss of jobs um, and people are um, worried about uh, other types of budget cuts. Um, so it's important to frame uh, any kind of benefits to vending and health as something that is going to uh, improve health care costs and also improve worker productivity. Uh, in terms of implementation, um, the next step, um, it's really important to keep all the partners that we've identified previously involved. It's also really important to keep staff, users, and other partners involved. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about how important it is to negotiate new contracts. Um, you may need to wait for an old contract to expire. Um, and during this lag time before implementation, um, you may be working with vendors or other people to identify um, healthy beverage uh, options. Um, you may need to retrain employees during the process um, of, of, of doing this implementation. Um, and you also, um, we talked a little bit about percentages and, um, and incremental steps. It's really great if you can get a 100% healthy beverage policy, um, but if not, during implementation, um, the, the phasing in of a 50% or 75% healthy um, beverage vending policy really needs um, clear implementation steps and timelines. Um, and then um, we're also going to talk, two important steps of implementation are uh, addressing barriers and also talking about sound con uh, contracting practices. In terms of barriers, um, we've talked about a little bit uh, of this a little bit. We've talked about um, how to approach decision makers. We've talked um, about uh, the fiscal climate. Uh, one thing we haven't talked about yet is resistance from vendors, the people who are providing uh, the products that you're going to be selling in the vending machine. Um, the main concern that vendors have is loss of revenue. Um, and um, there's been qu quite a bit of research done on this, um, but in the settings of schools. Um, this is because schools are the ones who have done healthy vending for a longer period of time, and there's more data there to be studied. And what we know from the data on schools and vending is that um, most of the time there is an initial drop-off in revenue, but in the long term um, there is not a loss of revenue to the schools because of healthy vending. Um, one thing that is, has also been studied um, is in schools is that the uh, actual loss of revenue that people are worried about, how much money schools make uh, off of vending machines versus how much the vending companies are making or the, the, the beverage companies are making, um, is really uh, skewed towards the, um, the beverage companies. And schools are making um, much less revenue as a proportion than the beverage companies. So it's important to ask those questions about what uh, your local um, your local cities and towns, what your priorities are. Then in terms of uh, contracting, um, one, a, a couple of tips that uh, we have found to be really helpful in contracting is to include whatever language that you want to have in contracting, including that right up front in your request for proposal so that the vendors who are bidding on it know exactly what it is uh, that you, you're asking for in healthy vending. Um, it's important, uh, if possible, to bring your vending operations together because if you have a larger scale, you get better prices, um, you uh, impact more people. Uh, within your contracts, you can talk about, uh, you can specify how healthy beverages should be priced, where they should be placed um, in relation to unhealthy beverages if you're not in a 100% uh, um, uh, context, um, whether or not uh, you can promote unhealthy products on the face of the machines, um, and then also phase in and percentages. Um, there are lots of things that you should look for in the contracts. We have a model contract um, available on our website that talks about uh, these things like marketing rights, contracting rights, um, how to get energy savings into the machine, 
um, how you get compliance through audit, um, and also how to keep the contract terms short so that you are able to renegotiate if there are new healthy or sustainable food guidelines that come down, um, come down the way. And then lastly, um, uh, semi-lastly, I'd like to talk about uh, enforcement. Um, once you've implemented a healthy vending policy, there's still the question of how to enforce it. And there are a number of things that you can do to make a policy more enforceable, uh, including strong enforcement provisions. Uh, in addition to the best contracting practices outlined above, uh, consider contracting provisions that allow your municipality to collect fines or liquidated damages, uh, revoke permits or contracts, or remove machines if a, if a vendor is noncompliant. Um, you need to monitor um, the implementation, and that means de designating city staff to monitor and report back to the city council or mayor on a regular basis um, every six months or even quarterly. Um, it's important to train staff and the public about healthy vending goals to make more people feel responsible for the success of the program. Uh, one great example from a heel city is Baldwin Park, California, mandates annual training for city staff on how to incorporate healthy vending and healthy snacks into special events. And then uh, requiring 100% healthy is the best way you can get to enforcement. It's really, um, you know, you eliminate the possibility of there being wiggle room, wiggle room for um, vendors to argue that machines are 50 or 75 or 25 percent uh, compliant. If you have a 100 percent uh, policy, it's a lot easier to enforce that policy. And then lastly, I just want to wrap up um, with some questions about how healthy vending fits into the big picture. You know, uh, all of your work is about changing the environment and making public places healthier. Um, and increasing the demand and ultimately the supply of healthy food. Um, and here are some questions that help frame the importance of vending policies in some other um, policies that are out there. The ultimate question, I think, is whether government should be, should be providing food to its employees and its visitors that's unhealthy um, and that could lead to more chronic diseases. And if you ask that ultimate question, I think that most reasonable reasonable people would agree that that is not what you want. Um, and then one last study I wanted to um, call, uh, call out is that a study that came out of the Harvard School of Public Health that talks about um, uh, how many calories you would need to eliminate um, in order to reduce obesity rates by 2020. And the number that they came up with was 64 excess calories per day. Um, and 64 seems like a really manageable number. Um, it, it, and the important thing with initiatives like healthy vending and healthy meetings is to realize that small changes in the, poli in the uh, settings that people find themselves in can get us much closer to that goal of eliminating um, these, number of cal these numbers of excess calories every day. Um, during the course of this um, uh, of today, I've talked to you about some resources that are available. All the steps um, and, and uh, other supporting materials are available in Making Change, a guide to healthier vending for municipalities. Um, and also um, connected to those are model contracts with many of the contracting principles that I've talked about. There's also um, great resources available at the Centers for Disease Control website. Um, these guidelines uh, on healthy food in government settings um, help inform many uh, initiatives out there, including the Let's Move Cities, Towns, and Counties campaigns. In particular, goal number four um, uh, of, of Let's Move Cities, Towns, and Counties is to improve access to healthy, affordable foods um, uh, by changing, uh, by implementing healthy and sustainable food service guidelines uh, in municipally or county-owned operated venues, um, and healthy vending is one step that you can take in that direction. Great. Thanks, Q. That was wonderful. I thought that step-by-step -step process you went through was really helpful. Um, really 
enjoyed the slide about partners, and sometimes some of your partners are beyond those that, that immediately come to mind, and the do's and don'ts. Um, thanks for that great uh, presentation. So now we are going to hear from a couple of municipalities and learn from their experience. And Charlotte um, will join us again. And she is first going to interview um, Jonathan Logan, Jr. And he's the executive director of the Marin County Service, Marin County Community Services District. And uh, Austin has played an integral role in development of the Marin City Health and Wellness Center, the Rocky Graham Park Development the Recreation Center Renovation Planning, and the Ballpark Rebuild Planning, um, as well as many other projects in Marin City. And so Charlotte, if you'll take it from here, and we're looking forward to the interview with Jonathan. Um, great. I'm so excited to be interviewing <clears throat> you, Jonathan. We worked together quite a bit uh, last year in 2013 on the nutrition standards for beverages, snacks, and meals um, in a variety of settings in Marin City. So I first want to ask you um, if, uh, if you could tell us a little bit about Marin City. All right, sure, Charlotte. First, I wanted to uh, thank you and uh, the Center for Public Health Advocacy uh, for organizing this uh, one webinar. Um, but Marin City, um, is a great community. It's, uh, it's an unincorpor unincorporated community located in southern Marin County, uh, just about five miles north of the Golden Gate Bridge. Uh, the community is the most racially diverse uh, concentrated area in the county with a population of approximately 3,500 residents. Uh, this is something that we celebrate. <clears throat> approximately 45 or 40 percent of residents are black, 40 percent uh, white, 14% Hispanic and 12 Asian and other. Uh, the comedians, the uh, community's median household income is less than 40K annually compared to 91 countywide. Um, similarly, there are some stark uh, health disparities that exist. For example, uh, Marin City residents have on average higher rates of obesity with life expectancy 16 years less than that of residents living in Ross, California. Ross, California, which is just uh, a few miles north of Marin City. Um, so being faced with anecdotal stories, general knowledge of the community, and, and, uh, and then data, um, you know, the board and, and myself and the community, we decided that, you know, this was totally unacceptable and we had to do something about it. Great. And so um, I know you're involved with many um, initiatives and efforts. Could you talk a little bit about the nutrition standards policy? What actually is in the policy? What settings does it apply to and when was it adopted? Yeah, so we, we started learning more and more about the causes of uh, the health disparities in, in Marin City and realized that there was a, a link to the fact that the community does not have a grocery store uh, and or easy access to affordable healthy food options. Uh, my board, which is the community's local elected leadership, I decided that something needed to be done and that they needed to take a leadership role in making sure that our policies and practices lined up with the community's vision for a more healthier future. And so to that end, um, uh, my staff uh, started working with uh, members of the community, uh, some, some advocates, local advocates here. Um, CCPHA, Public Health Institute, the County of Marin Public Health Department, and the Health and Wellness Clinic to develop a wellness policy that would apply to the Community Services District. And in December of 2013, that policy was adopted. And it, is, it established uh, minimal nutrition guidelines and standards for the food that we purchase and, and serve the community, uh, both in you know, during meetings and programs and other community activities that we, we offer. Um, this policy, it not only affected the meals that we, we serve um, directly, but the meals that we sponsor indirectly. Um, we often grant funds for local community events that are hosted by individuals and, and also other community agencies. And we thought that you know, if, if 
our money was going to go towards providing food, then we wanted it to meet, you know, uh, some some really basic uh, standards, uh, nutrition standards. So we included that in the policy. We also included uh, some some language and policy around our our vending machine, and uh, we the board uh, decided that they wanted all vending mach machines within the district um, to have you know, to comply with this policy and the USDA standards 100%. And so that's also in the policy. And then something that's uh, not not related, but it, it relates to health, not directly related, but it relates to health, and, which is the, the board decided to uh, designate uh, our, our campus as a smoke-free campus. And so uh, uh, visitors and, and users of our facilities here are asked to smoke in uh, designated areas that are away from from buildings. Um, another component in the policy is just the uh, the training component. We thought it would be uh, really important to uh, uh, give ourselves a little bit of an on ramp, and so the policy was adopted in December, um, but we didn't. Uh, it, it wasn't to be uh, fully in effect until uh, February of the of the following year, and so that gave us about two months to. I train our staff on, you know, the importance of this policy and how it would apply to them in their, day, you know, their everyday activities, and then also on how it would apply and affect the programs that they run. Can you tell us a little bit more about how the policy? I, I would think at the training uh, that you were able to conduct, and then also implementation of the policy. The nutrition standards policy. Um, how has that impacted your staff? How have they responded to it? Yeah, we have a we have a, a great group of folks uh, here on on staff uh, at the district, and and so the policy was was re well received by folks. They totally understood the uh, intent of the policy and thought it was a good idea. But uh, so much of what we're talking about is, uh, you know behavioral changes and so uh, what we what we notice is that even though folks supported the policy and the the intent and the goals of the policy uh, it didn't translate directly in behavior right away uh, but since the policy has been adopted and you know our part of our implementation strategy again was the training um, so making folks aware of sort of you know the implications of the food that they were eating the food that was uh, going to be served to you know, children, adults, and seniors through our many uh, programs and activities. Helping them understand it, I think, has, has, has gone a long way in, in just really supporting the success of, of the policy. And so, um, you know, one, one just quick example is, uh, you know, uh, fast food is something, obviously, that's not, not healthy. And we have uh, an employee here who, um, you know, is very conscious now when he uh, makes that purchase, and, and he's even indicated that he's he's cut down on uh, the amount that he eats, and he he definitely is you know very aware that um, it's not something that he should do in front of kids because it will influence what they what they do. So, um, yeah, they it's it's been well received overall the policy. Um, well, and that's such a great anecdote in terms of a policy. And the discussion around the policy and the training and then implementing it um, is is not only impacting the youth and the community that serve, but that you have this anecdote about an individual employee who is making changes in his own life. That's a great story. Um, so I wanted to give you uh, this uh, the next question. I wanted to give you the opportunity, Jonathan, to just talk a little bit more about how this policy fits into your larger and longer term vision and, and the board's longer term and larger vision for health in Marin City. You talked about the health disparities, which are severe, the, um, the loss of, of productive years, which is um, just startling and unacceptable. You've talked about the vision that the community has to gain a grocery store and how nutrition standards are a small step toward bringing healthy options into the community. 
I just want you to be able to kind of toot your own horn for a minute and talk about how this policy does fit into that larger and longer term vision of health and some of the things that you're moving forward with. Yeah, so the, the board adopted uh, health as one of its values. Uh, Marin City is a healthy community, and, and that's our aspirational uh, goal for, for Marin City. And so um, to that end, uh, this policy was adopted. Uh, but it was also recognized that this policy doesn't um, solve all of the problems overnight. It, it helps us take a leadership role, make the issue an important issue and uh, on the minds of, of people that we interact with, uh, but it, it doesn't do everything. And so there's some, um, uh, you know, built environment changes that we have to do um, and that we're doing now, which is, which is really great. Uh, we're improving local infrastructure uh, here in the community, uh, rebuilding some of our uh, highly used public uh, spaces and, and facilities. Uh, we're going to break ground on Rocky Graham Park, which is about an acre, um, but it, it'll be a multi-use inter intergenerational park here in Marin City. And we, we know that when you couple food with uh, healthy lifestyle options such as playing at, at a park or just relaxing at a park, um, that all contributes to the overall overall health. So this policy in my mind, as I said, it, it doesn't go uh, far enough. It's not enough. But what it does do is it helps us keep the momentum going and helps us to connect some of the dots, um, you know, around, uh, you know, what actually contributes to a healthy lifestyle for, for our residents. And so um, we're just really excited about where this where this thing is, where it's going. Great. So I want to thank you so much for your the the insight into Marin City and let people know that we will have a link to the Marin City website, which um, has links to the policy, and um, you could you will be able to contact the Marin City Community Services District those of you who are participating to get more um, more specific information if that's something that would help you. Um, so Julie, I'm wondering if you could interview, uh, excuse me, if you could introduce Ismael Vila from the city of San Fernando. Absolutely, I'd love to do so. And thank you, Jonathan. Um, I loved hearing about the implementation strategy that you guys adopted. So our next um, interviewee, interviewee is Ismael Aguila and he's the operations manager for the Recreation and uh, Community Services Department for the city of San Fernando. And um, the, uh, which includes overseeing eight park facilities and community programs such as Senior Meals Program, Youth Sports, San Fernando Regional Pool Facility, award-winning Master Mariachi Apprentice Program, and award-winning 100 Citizens Program. Um, many special events and bus transportation. And Ismail also has been working on implementing policies and programs to improve the health of the residents of the city of San Fernando. So Charlotte and Ismail, if you'll take over, it'd be great. Great. Well, you've all heard me um, compliment uh, Ismail on the, or maybe you didn't, maybe we were talking about this beforehand, um, before we started the webinar, the fantastic aquatic center um, and recreation center that, that San Fernando offers to its uh, residents and employees. So um, welcome, Ismael. And, and my first question is, um, what do you want us to know about San Fernando? Well, first, uh, Charlotte, thank you very much for having me uh, you know, join this, uh, this uh, webinar here. I think what you guys are doing is great. And I'm actually very excited to see there's so many people uh, that are involved uh, on this uh, webinar uh, outside of California. Know, kind of really uh, uh, reminds me and uh, demonstrates uh, how far we've come in the last 10, 15 years regarding uh, health and, and policy and uh, you know, get the whole country on board and make some changes here. Uh, as far as what I want people to know about San Fernando, I mean, I think San Fernando is a very unique city. It's a beautiful city that's uh, been around for over 100 years. Um, it's located uh, um, you know, in Los Angeles County uh, uh, on the north, uh, probably about, um, about 25 minutes uh, northeast of, uh, of Los Angeles downtown. Uh, and what's unique about it is that the city is about two and a half square miles, and it's actually surrounded by the city uh, of Los Angeles. 
it's just a little pocket there. And the only reason why it didn't get consumed by the city of Los Angeles is because the city had its own uh, water wells and was able to remain as an independent city. Um, the, the population we have here in the city of San Fernando is about approximately 23,000. Again, it's about two and a half square miles. About 93% Latino. And uh, also the obesity, the childhood obesity rates here are about uh, you know 38% uh, as compared to the county average of 23%. Uh, um, you know, we have lots of parks here. Uh, as you mentioned, we have roughly uh, eight parks that uh, our uh, residents can utilize here. Um, you know, the medium household uh, income for our uh, uh, residents here is about 51,000. And the life expectancy rankings for residents in the city of San Fernando are uh, ranked uh, 77th out of 101 in out of all of LA County. Um, we have approximately 20 schools here uh, in the city, which is quite a few schools in a two and a half uh, mile uh, uh, square radius. Uh, and about 28% of our youth, uh, you know, between the age of about 5 to 18, they're actually living, uh, you know, below, below poverty levels. And about 38% of all of our residents are under the age of 18. So, you know, because of that data, we knew that, uh, you know, uh, we should be addressing health. And, and in particular, my department, Recreation Community Service, because the usage of our parks will get about 250,000 visits per year, and about 30, uh, which is made up of about 35,000 individuals. So there's clearly a high usage of our park facilities uh, targeting a population that, uh, that is in some need of help. Um, thank you. And so uh, in mentioning all of these uh, facilities, um, could you tell us about the policy, your policy and how it applies to the, the facilities that you're, um, that you're working with? Right. <laughs> Back in uh, November of uh, 2011, uh, the City Council uh, did, uh, you know, uh, pass a resolution uh, to, uh, for a he healthy vending machine policy, and that would focus on all the vending machines at all the city, city facilities, uh, and uh, those would include City Hall, the Police Department, Public Works Department, and all the park facilities, including our magnificent uh, pool facility that uh, Charlotte has, uh, has mentioned on this call. Uh, all the snacks uh, at these vending machines uh, are following uh, the, the SB12 um, uh, policy, which is at food standards for all the schools in K-12, and also the SB965 uh, for all the beverages. Um, and uh, again, that was back in 2000, uh, 2011, and that was passed as a resolution. Great. So when you and I were preparing for this interview, we were talking a little bit, uh, we talked quite a bit actually about um, the vendors and your interactions with um, your vending machine vendors. And I, I would love for you to share um, both your story about the snack vendor, maybe starting with that, including the anecdote that you brought to my attention, and then talking about the beverage vendor. Right, right. You know, uh, you know, you know. Implementing the, the policy was uh, a little easier than I would have thought, and I'll, I'll kind of, you know, thank uh, the California Center for Public Health Advocacy for a lot of their assistance, because when in meetings with them, they really kind of laid out the whole seven steps, uh, you know, to making change with that Q referred to. Um, uh, this is the first time I actually heard the seven steps officially, uh, uh, but the, the, everything they talked to us was basically in that order, talking about the inventory, the partners. Uh, you know, uh, you know the the control, the standards, and, and all that. Uh, you know, the, the you know, following their, their their guidelines, we were able to you know make sure that we followed those, all the steps uh, you know to make this happen. But what we're referring to is was the vendor. That the vendor was something that was kind of hard to be prepped for by uh, by by anyone. You know, we had a vendor uh, that was uh, you know he's uh, born here in the city of San Fernando and he remains to stay here. He's a you know old gentleman, Vietnam vet, uh, old school. T tough, uh, hard knocks uh, kind of a guy, and when I first approached him about the possibility of implementing a policy, uh, you can imagine the, the look that he gave me. He was he was not happy, and I had to take a few steps back because I thought uh, I would probably be his next uh, victim there. Um, but uh, you know, the, the the relationship that I built with him uh, in the upcoming months um, was uh, was terrific. You know, I you know I made sure that uh, the information I was given to him that uh, you know he didn't really uh, get defensive on it and really educated him on the in the importance of what the policies are doing and how there's change happening and how many of the schools have adopted policies and once I mentioned that the schools were adopting policies then he started talking about some of his other vendors that he's talked to who have also been uh, you know have had to make change uh, with uh, the, uh, the the type of uh, uh, stuff that they're selling in those vending machines and then he started listening a little bit more to me because uh, he remembers talking to some other vendors uh, saying it wasn't 
all that bad. And you know, this went on for a few weeks, uh, and then probably about a couple months later, he, he kind of came up to me. And after all the literature that I gave him, he, he came up to me and said, you know what, I think you're right. I think that uh, what I'm selling has a strong control on, on kids. And he said that he, was, uh, he had opened up a vending machine and he was stocking it when um, he saw a little girl who was uh, crying and pleading to her mom to, to buy her uh, a candy. And the mom was basically saying, uh, no, no, you've had enough and you know, it's not going to buy anything. And just, you know, just was just holding a, a tantrum just to get candy. And it was at that point that, you know, in him being a grandfather, that he just thought to himself, said, wow, the things I'm selling here really control kids. And, uh, and all the information that we gave him, you know, really started kind of, uh, you know, sinking in. And, uh, and after that, I mean, he was probably one of our strongest, uh, you, know, uh, you know, partners. I mean, he was uh, pushing for it. Uh, he attended all of our commission meetings, uh, even the city council. And he talked about how, uh, you know, and basically told that same story about the importance of, uh, of having this passed. Uh, um, you know, and even though he was a little afraid that he may uh, see a loss in revenue, uh, he was still on board and wanted to have, uh, wanted to pass because he knew the, the, the significance of it. So I think that's just a, you know, a nice story to, to, to hear because uh, coming from the, the type of gentleman that I described he was and to make that full 180 degree turn to uh, support uh, the, the healthy policies was, uh, was great to see. Um, thank you. And then could you just talk a little bit about um, the policy and how it led to the contract with Coca-Cola and how you um, went about through the, the RFP and contracting process um, putting some limits on both the products that you're sell that they're able to sell and also the uh, what the design of the machines right right yeah you know we we had coca-cola that was our distributor for our vending machines and coke actually has a uh, a large corporate office just about a mile and a half down uh, down the street so they had an interest of keeping uh, uh, you know their vending machines uh, in, our, in our park facilities uh, the city did not have a contract with them so uh, you know, in order to move forward on this, uh, and, uh, and time was short, we uh, made some calls, and uh, you know, uh, we did a, an informal uh, RFP to get the other uh, potential uh, uh, you know, proposals on on a, an event machine contract. But we ended up going with Coke, and in that, we were able to uh, leverage for them both clearly to uh, uh, to uh, make sure that all the drinks were following the SB 965. Also, they had to bring in brand new vending machines. Uh, vending machines also had to be. Uh, um, uh, you know, couldn't have uh, any uh, symbols or anything uh, of, of, of logos of Coca-Cola. Everything had to be, uh, I think, Doc Nero, the water that they have there. Um, and uh, and then we also negotiate for them to provide us uh, a bottle of water for many of our special events and also, I think, about $1,000 for our 4th of July uh, events. Um, yeah. And the only thing we did not negotiate with them at that time, because we were trying to move pretty quick, was uh, the actual cost of the, of the beverages. Um, although we were charging a dollar for the beverages for that 16 ounce uh, at the time, um, we didn't negotiate that, um, uh, and uh, Coca-Cola did, did end up raising the rate to about a dollar fifty. But you know, a dollar was on the low end to begin with. Uh, I know all of our surrounding uh, uh, partners that we saw in, uh, in, in Los Angeles uh, um, all were about dollar twenty-five uh, range. So uh, for us to be a dollar to go up to a dollar twenty-five or to a dollar fifty, uh, we didn't think that that was uh, too much. Up uh, at this point, uh, if, as long as we could get uh, uh, all the other things that we were requesting from uh, from Coca Cola. Yes, and so speaking of money and the price of the items, um, what happened? What has happened with your revenues since? Yeah, you know what, and, and I'll be honest. With you, put into place. Yeah. This was very scary. I mean, not only did I mean we deal with typical barriers of uh, you know even staff were uh, you know no we don't want this to happen and uh, even some of the public was no we don't want this to happen. Uh, we also had the concern there of, of of revenues. And I remember talking to the California Center for Public Health Advocacy, and and they gave me a few slides, some information, but it was very limited as far as you know anything that would uh, reassure our vendors and even the city because the city would get um, you know a percentage of the sales. So uh, and the city was dealing with a downward spiral of of. Uh, of loss of revenues, uh, you know, it was that whole, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, the Great Recession. Um, so the city did not want to lose any money whatsoever. So that was a, a big concern. Um, what we did see, see so the past, uh, the ordinance passed. Uh, sorry, the resolution was passed in uh, no, uh, November of 2011. So it was implemented in March of 2012. So going back to the data, that uh, we actually did see a decrease in, uh, in in sales, and I think that decrease was roughly about. Um, 
about three months roughly. I'm actually pulled up my slide to look at it here. Uh, yeah, we went down to roughly, after March was implemented, we shot down probably about 50% sales that dropped down in that one month. Uh, but about uh, three months after that, uh, in pretty close to the six months, it jumped right back uh, to uh, where it was and actually surpassed where we were, uh, you know, in the previous year. So since then, you know, as far as the, the revenues coming in, the percentage coming in, uh, it's been about the same. And you can contribute that to, you know, people just kind of, you know, uh, going along with, uh, with, with the policy. But also, you know, Coca-Cola did raise their rate uh, uh, you know, by, uh, by 50 cents. And also the food vendor did raise his rates by about 5 or 10%. Uh, to uh, to account for some of the changes there, so you know the vendor was uh, you know uh, afraid there at the beginning, but toward the end there, and even in my conversation with him just uh, uh, you know earlier this week, um, you know he says that he's happy. I mean the revs are right back, um, and um, he sees that people are buying uh, the food and the volume is still there. So uh, you know uh, despite us having some scares there, it actually ended up uh, you know balancing itself back out. Uh, that's great. And then just final question, uh, how much revenue does the city generate per year from the vending machines and what is it dedicated to? Right. Right now we look at uh, look at the map, we get about 3,500 that comes from the, the snack vending machines and we get roughly another 2,500 that comes from the, uh, from the beverages. And the money goes into account for wellness programs for the city. Some that could be used for city employees or could be used for community wellness programs. And, uh, and the great thing about all of this, uh, you know, I mean, the city became a healthy city back in 2010. They implemented some smoking policies, and then they implemented healthy vending machine policy. It provided a lot of momentum for city and for council members when they see the, um, you know, all the, the 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 residents and how happy they are in the direction the city is going uh, as far as health. That so this actually got on board to uh, commit to a year commitment of a uh, health campaign and health messages in every avenue they have, whether it be uh, uh, in the water bill, uh, in the in the trolley systems, uh, the bus shelters, uh, in all the programs that the park offers, and also bringing back a 5K relay race. Uh, uh, so the city's really uh, made uh, an effort to uh, promote health and uh, and continue to re uh, support uh, the healthy vending machine policies. Great. Well, thank you so much, Ismael, and and again for all of you on the call, we will send out the link to the city's website, and you can get in touch with Ismael or his staff if you're interested in learning more. Um, before I turn it back to Julie, just, just find out if we have any questions. I, I just wanted to, to point out that both Jonathan and Ismael talked about um, how the policy is leading to bigger changes in the city. And, and I think that when we talk about policy, we want there to be changes in behavior. Um, we also want there to be changes in the culture of the organization and the city. And eventually, we want there to be cha uh, changes in norms so that the norm within the city becomes health. And I think Jonathan and Ismael have both very clearly showed us how a seemingly very simple policy, a simple no low-cost policy, when, when crafted and implemented well, can then take the city to the next level in terms of supporting the health of residents and also supporting the health of employees. And that this is particularly important when we're looking at communities that are facing um, the kinds of health disparities that both of our, uh, both of our uh, community services directors were talking about in the low-income communities of color. Um, so back to you, Julie. Great. Thanks, Charlotte. And thanks, Ismael. I thought um, the vendor stories were great. And I think for folks who are just embarking on this journey, it's helpful to hear um, you know, what others have gone through. Um, so we do have time for some questions and answers. And anyone who has a question and hasn't submitted it, please do so. Um, just type it in in the right-hand column that should be showing on your screen. And um, I'm going to turn it over to Charlotte for the Q&A. Okay, well, um, I don't see any questions. I'm going to take that as a sign that people are really ready to go to lunch. Um, so I want to encourage you to have a healthy lunch and to drink water. Um, and want to thank everyone who was on the call. And, and um, Julie, I'll, 
I'll um, send it back to you to, for closing remarks. Okay, great. Thanks, Charlotte. Um, so as you see on this slide that's in front of you now, you have the contact information for the various um, Hill Cities campaigns in each of the uh, five states, and um, as well as some of the other um, resources that we have talked about. Um, and, and here's some more of our contact information. And we really do, and folks that are out there from the various states, we really do want to hear from you um, as the directors of our Heal Cities and Towns campaign. So please reach out to us, and um, we'd like to help you get rolling on a healthy food environment in your municipality. Um, so thanks to everyone. And you will receive an email with a link to the recording and then also um, an evaluation. And I know we get those uh, requests to do evaluations, and sometimes we don't feel like we have time to do them. But if you can, it would be great, because as the Heal Nation and for future webinars, the information is really helpful so that we can make these as useful for everybody's time as possible. So thank you, and have a great, healthy lunch. And um, we'll hopefully have you tune in to a webinar soon. <laughs>